Okay, we are underway. Um, Richard, first of all, would you give me your full name and spell your full name for me? Uh, my full name is Richard, R-I-C-H-A-R-D, Bun, please don't use Bun, B-U-N-N, uh, uh, McKenzie, M-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E. Um, I want to start out by asking you to just describe for me the whole experience and circumstances that surrounded that uh, Wall Street Journal article of yours. How okay. that came about, why you wrote it, what impact it had on you, what kind of response do you get, just, just talk to me. Um, well, I think we need to start with the fact that I, uh, I, I grew up in an orphanage uh, in North Carolina in the 1950s. Um, my parents were uh, severe alcoholics. They divorced when I was five. Uh, my mother committed suicide when I was 10 and uh, I was placed in an orphanage, Bering Springs Home for Children, uh, near Statesville, uh, North Carolina at the age of 10. This was 1952. And after uh, I got out of the orphanage, uh, well I went on to college and got degrees, a string of degrees, but I, I learned very quickly that any time I brought up my orphanage background, uh, uh, people would say, oh dear, or they would say something to the effect that, well, you've done well uh, in spite of uh, your childhood or your orphanage upbringing, and it was very difficult for me to explain to them that I'd done, I've done what I've done because I grew up in this orphanage. So, uh, for decades, I, I basically went quiet with my uh, orphanage background. Well, in, in the early 90s, I had never gone public uh, with my views. Uh, only my close friends and family members uh, knew about it. Uh, and uh, so, in 1994, the, the Republicans won the House and Newt Gingrich was elevated to Speaker of the House uh, uh, to be. And just after the election, he made a comment off the cuff about how welfare kids would be better off in private orphanages than in the welfare system. Well, that gave rise to a media firestorm in which uh, all the major publications, all the major papers and news uh, magazines like uh, Newsweek and uh, USA, uh, USA News World Report uh, came out with uh, covers with poor orphanage waifs, uh, you know, holding out their hands as if they were pleading uh, for more girl and a Dickinsonian uh, uh, film. And then the experts, uh, the journalists went to experts, all of whom said something to the effect that orphanages were just bad places. Uh, the dean of the Columbia University School of Social Work uh, went so far as to say uh, orphanages damage kids. And this is pretty much a quote. Orphanages damage kids intellectually, behaviorally, and emotionally. And, and I took that quote to heart because I looked at myself and I said, well, was I damaged in, in any of those ways because of my experience? Do I know kids with whom I grew up that were damaged in, in that way and were today dysfunctional? I also recalled how when we went back to homecoming, we were not uh, curling up in fetal positions lamenting our childhoods, but rather we were um, uh, we were extolling the good fortune of having grown up the way we had, and if, if there was any problem at homecoming, it was, it was basically uh, one orphan trying to up the other uh, with, uh, with some lie about what he did uh, back while he was at, at the home, which is what we called uh, our orphanage. The home, it wasn't our home or, or my home, it, was, uh, it wasn't even home, it was always the uh, home. And, well, anyway. In the middle of that debate, I decided to go public uh, with, uh, uh, with my background, and I wrote a column that uh, sent it to the Wall Street Journal that said, in essence, that um, you know these homes were not perfect places, but they were a damn sight better 
uh, than what the experts are saying they were. And I recounted a number of statistics uh, about the success of the kids whom I knew. Uh, I knew that 95% uh, of the kids I grew up with, uh, two or three years ahead of me, behind me, 95% had college degrees, many had advanced degrees, and, and they were in pretty darn good shape. And I also noted how uh, during World War II, uh, the military was rejecting uh, 38 to 40 percent of all uh, recruits for physical problems or whatever. Uh, they only rejected one quarter of one percent of the recruits from uh, the home. And so anyway, uh, uh, that, uh, that column had an impact and I, I was overwhelmed with responses. My phone was ringing off the hook the morning it appeared. Uh, I got a boat load of letters and then I got a, a many emails and if it were done today I'd gotten many more emails to, uh, today. But in, anyway, uh, what was really surprising about the response is a lot of the people who were contacting me had grown up in homes in orphanages themselves. And they were saying, in effect, right on, uh, my home was not perfect, but it was a damn sight better than what uh, uh, others are, are, are saying about it. And that caused me to wonder, uh, because these, these responses were, alumni were all over the country. Uh, it, it caused me to wonder whether uh, the experts had it right, especially when some of the alumni were telling me it's clear from your column that my home was better than your home and we want you to come to our homecoming uh, uh, just so I can prove that uh, point uh, to you. Well that set me on a, on a new life course, uh, advocacy or investigation. At the time, I thought my home was special. The response indicated it might not be all that special. So I uh, started conducting surveys of orphanage alumni, at least to the extent that I could. I had 30 uh, academics and uh, practitioners uh, sort of work with me to make sure that uh, personal biases didn't creep into either my survey instrument or, or the way I conducted the, uh, the survey. Uh, the survey was eight to nine pages long, and I got a 62 response rate. With uh, the the alumni added uh, uh, 4,000 pages, single space pages of additional comments explaining how, about their orphan experience. Well, the general conclusion I drew from the survey, and I surveyed something uh, on the order of 2,500 alumni from 15 homes. The general conclusion is that the orphanage alumni have outpaced their age counterparts in the general white population by wide margins on all, almost every measure. And by that I mean uh, the orphanage alumni uh, had a 39% higher uh, college graduation rate, a 200% higher uh, advanced degree, uh, rate than the general white population. Uh, they had uh, incomes that were 10 to 60 percent higher than the median incomes of uh, the general white population. By the way, I'm, I'm mentioning general white, white population because all the alumni in my survey were, uh, were white. And this is because in the 19th, early 60s and before, uh, orphanages were color-coded. Uh, in North Carolina, you had 32 uh, uh, white orphanages and you had 16 uh, black orphanages. Well, anyway, uh, uh, the income was higher, the attitude toward life was much higher than, uh, than a survey conducted at the University of Chicago, the incarceration uh, rate was much lower, the unemployment rate was one quarter of what it was at the time of my uh, survey, and moreover, when I asked the alumni to explain to relate uh, how they viewed their their orphanage experience, 85% uh, indicated that they looked back on their experience favorably or very favorably, and the overwhelming was very favorably. Uh, only less than 2%, I think it was, maybe 3%, uh, said that they looked back on their experience uh, unfavorably or very unfavorably, and the rest were, well, there were good and bad uh, components. And that uh, uh, kind of, of surprised me and, 
And when I ask him about, well, what do you think about your experience versus foster care, um, almost all of them uh, shuddered uh, at the thought of having to be placed in foster care as they knew it today. Uh, relative to their uh, their orphanage care and and there's a good reason uh, that many of them find fault with the foster care and that is that um, uh, the biggest problem in foster care is that you have a sizable percentage of the children who go into the system and never come out and many of them uh, go from one placement to the next to the next to the next and even social workers have a have a, uh, uh, a phrase for it it's called permanent temporary care and just imagine uh, you're changing uh, the location where you live for your, your children 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 times, much less put them in different people's hands. And consider a system where the, the child is, is always second fiddle to the biological child and also can be, uh, uh, can be dropped at the, um, at, at, at the decision of the foster care parents. The great thing about the orphanage that I found is that uh, when I went there, I knew I could be there uh, until I, I, I graduated. And it was my decision to leave. It wasn't uh, the home's decision to uh, boot me out. Well, Unless, let, of course, I have a bad experience. Let, let me ask you a question. As you know, the social worker community, Yeah. going back as far as the 1890s with the orphan trains and coming up to the early 20th century with the White House conference of I think it was 1909 or whatever, there has been a consistent attitude among professional social workers yes. that the best place to put children is in a family situation. Well, and and what, why do you think, what is, your, what is your take on why that has been a consistent attitude on the part of the social, professional social workers and in general that social workers look with disdain upon aggregate institutional warehousing as they would cause, call it of, of children? Well, I, I think one of the uh, unheralded uh, reasons is that uh, social workers have an industry and they would like to expand uh, their industry and expand their influence in it. The people haven't noticed the conflict of, of interest. The thing is to take over a greater and greater share of child welfare. But you've got to remember that in the 1890s and after, in the early 20th uh, century, uh, you basically had a a comparison between the realities of the orphanages as they existed then uh, and the imagery or the imagined uh, realities of, of foster care. And you always had th this separate painting of an orphanage as a cold and loveless institution versus a family setting that was warm and fuzzy with loving, responsible uh, uh, families. Well, the, the imagery won out over the realities because in, in, in those early years, orphanages were not luxurious places and they required a lot of, a lot of work. But many social workers don't realize that the uh, conditions in the orphanages pretty much reflected the, the economic realities of the time. I mean, times were tough in the 19th century. Uh, incomes were low. By today's standards, almost all Americans were poor. And many of them were totally destitute by today's standards. And many of the kids that they took in uh, were destitute before they went to the orphanage. And so the orphanage may have been a place where you had rows of beds and, uh, and sleeping porches and so forth, and rows of, of dinner tables. Uh, and their food may not have always been, you know, the highest quality as measured by uh, today's standards. But, uh, as historians have found in a, in a volume that I, I edited, um, these, these orphanages just generally improved uh, the life circumstances of the kids in, in, their, in their care. So that improvement got lost and then you had a, a number of, of studies that were done uh, throughout the first 50 or 60 years 
uh, that showed that institutional care was uh, inferior to home care. And social workers always love to say that, uh, you know, a loving and responsible family is far superior to a, a cold and loveless institution. Well, of course that's true. My reaction is, duh. Uh, the problem with, uh, uh, with child welfare is that a lot of biological families are not, don't fit the model of being loving and responsible. Sometimes they're loving, but totally irresponsible. Sometimes they're unloving and irresponsible. And, and that's the core of the problem. Uh, and as a result, of, uh, an orphanage might be an imperfect place, but it can be better than the situation that the families, uh, uh, the kids uh, come from. And uh, so you, you had all these studies about, um, about the defects in, in the orphanage system. And some of them, I'm sure, were, were valid, but you also have uh, inferior, inadequate uh, research methods during the Newt Gingrich orphanage media firestorm. Uh, social workers of all sorts came out and cited a body of literature. I had a, uh, uh, a psychologist who taught research methods uh, uh, take a look at all of this literature and he found that they were all citing about 35 studies and he reviewed the studies and he found tremendous defects in the study. For example, you would have one psychologist, psychiatrist uh, do publish a series of six studies. All of them would be uh, 10 or 15 uh, students in the study. The study would not reveal whether these students were randomly drawn from the population of, of orphanage kids or were somehow clinical referrals or just picked out because you know they may have had uh, unusual uh, uh, problems and indeed there's there was one study that had 10 kids in it it's out of St. Louis I can't remember the author's name but 10 children in this classified as institutionalized well, when you looked at the study, you found that uh, uh, three of those kids might have been from children's home, three from uh, juvenile detention, three from uh, a variety of other uh, uh, situations. And, and as a result, <laughs> you have a mixed bag there that, uh, that people have concluded that uh, orphanages are bad. Then uh, this uh, psychology professor uh, found that there were several studies done during the first half of the 20th century, large-scale studies, that were never cited uh, in the debate. Uh, one such study came out of Israel, and it was about uh, 3,000 students included in the debate. And, and guess what? Uh, the results were very positive relative to the uh, orphanage. Uh, uh, result. I mean, the orphanage uh, results were better than, than foster care, and, and that kind of study is being duplicated today in, in, at Duke University, where a team of researchers who have no interest in orphanages are investigating the outcomes of orphanages in poor countries in Africa, India, Bangladesh, and the Philippines, and, and so forth. And, and the studies have been going on for five or more years uh, now, uh, they basically have found uh, that the kids in orphanages, are, their outcomes are on par with the kids who grew up in biological families and superior to the kids uh, in foster care. Let, let me ask you. you mentioned in your book a fellow that you nicknamed Bowtie. Yes. Um, and he, he was abusive. Yes. He was physically abusive. I also assume that at Barium Springs, as at Thompson, in the 1950s, that it was not unknown for a child to be spanked. Well, spanking was um, uh, common in, in orphanages, but you've got to realize, you got to think in terms of the time. Back in the 1950s and before, uh, spankings, whippings, uh, spare the rod, and what's the old saying? Uh, uh, harm the child. Uh, spanking was, was very common. And no one really knows whether there were more spankings, whippings, or whatever 
uh, or physical abuse in orphanages than in, than in families. And uh, what we do know is that it's easier to detect uh, physical abuse in, in congregate care type orphanages where they're open to uh, uh, the public. I, I wish I could point to research that would, would settle uh, that issue. Uh, all I can uh, say is that, again, I did an edited volume of histories of orphanages by academic historians. And I ask every scholar that if you mention abuse, neglect, molestation, whatever, uh, I want you to say something, compare it with what's going on uh, in the world outside of the home. Is it better, worse? I said, I don't care if it's worse, just tell me. And if you can't say, be sure to say you can't tell. And there were several historians that were able to make a, a statistical comparisons and there, were, there was no undue uh, physical abuse or it wasn't more prevalent in orphanages. And others had to say, well, we have no evidence to uh, say one way uh, or the other. I can say from my own personal experiences, I got more switchings, which is what my family members called, before I went uh, to uh, my orphanage than I did uh, in my orphanage. And, and to Bowtie, he literally was uh, brutal. And I'm absolutely convinced that all orphanages had bow ties uh, in their, their midst. And I'm absolutely convinced that all orphanages did harm uh, some kids to uh, some uh, extent. The question is, and the realistic question is, what was the batting average? Did they improve the kids' uh, circumstances? Uh, and also, don't forget, uh, times were different. You can't use the standards of care today uh, to evaluate the standards of care uh, long ago. We know much more about child welfare today than we did then. We know that physical abuse is much more harmful uh, emotionally and so forth, whether you're in an orphanage or not, than we understood uh, back in the 50s and before. Let me tell you an interesting thing. I'm, I hope I'm going to be able to interview a fellow by the name of John Shelby Spawn, yeah. who's a very progressive theologian and Episcopal, retired Episcopal priest. And you're, a, you're an economist. Yes. And I would assume that Barium Springs, like Thompson, ran a dairy farm. Yes. You had cows. Cows. And you milked cows. Yes. And you fed cows. And, we, and you cleaned up after cows. Now, one of the things that Spong said, and he was, he was very much in favor of the end of the traditional Thompson Orphanage. He said, looking at it purely from an economic standpoint, the running of a dairy farm was bad business because A, it was diverting resources away from children to actually take care of cows. Yeah. And also, he said that looking at the statistical effectiveness of that dairy farm as over against other dairy farms, it was really not an economically efficient dairy farm by any sort of measurable standard whatsoever. Yeah. Now what would be your response to the idea that these orphanages were spending so much money on cows? Well, all I, I, I don't know the era you're, you're talking about. You're talking about the 1950s? Well, by, in, in the early uh, 1900s, uh, farming was probably uh, efficient relative to what orphanages could have bought their food for uh, 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 then. But as large-scale farming came into place, as productivity in agriculture in, increased and became much more mechanized, the, uh, the economic advantage of orphanages, which was child labor, uh, sort of diminished. And by the 1950s, it probably was true. In fact, I'd almost bet you that it was true uh, that the dairy farm and at a Barium Springs Home for Children uh, was more was a drain uh, on the budget. And soon after I left in 1960, uh, they dismantled uh, the dairy farm. But uh, one of the heads of my home told me that you know one of the reasons it costs so much to care for kids today is that they don't have the farming and they don't have the uh, laundry and and the sewing rooms and so forth, print shops where kids work. Uh, 
he said uh, that 85 percent of the cost of care was covered by child labor. They were 85 percent self-sufficient. Now my guess is that percentage varies across uh, different orphanages. So you do away with, uh, with, with all the farming and we had a complete farm. We had dairy, we had pigs, we had sheep, we had beef cattle, we had 5,000 chickens and laying hens and uh, so forth. Uh, uh, when you take that away uh, and then you regulate child labor out of existence, uh, the costs of care are, are, are going to be higher. And, and by the way, the cost of caring for a child uh, in the 1950s at my home and another home in South Carolina uh, was in today's dollars only eight to nine thousand dollars a year. That's out-of-pocket expenditures. And, and the reason is that so much of the rest of the cost of care was covered by uh, child labor. We cut the grass, we uh, uh, combined the wheat, we fed the pigs and, uh, and so forth. But uh, it was growing uh, uh, a problem uh, for the home uh, during the 50s and then into the 60s. It, and then, of course, the child labor. Uh, I had a lawyer look at a film done by Barium Springs in 1956, and Barium proudly showed all of the work, uh, work types of work that the kids did. That, you know, baling hay and, and painting buildings and mowing lawns with, you know, these riding mowers that are three or four feet uh, wide. I had her evaluate the film for the legalities of the work today. And it was a 26-minute film. And she said, Richard, and she's a labor lawyer, she said, Richard, there's not a thing in the uh, film uh, that the kids were doing that they could do legally uh, today. So if you, if you can't do those things, and it's tough. Some homes uh, uh, can't even ask their kids to go to the grocery store or, or, or rake leaves. And some of it's legal liability and others of it is just a fear of having to pay uh, minimum wages for, for children's work. Well, do you think you know that one of the criticisms, let me get that go over. Yeah, you forgot about aircraft. Oh, <laughs> I can filter most of this stuff out. Um, you know, one of the criticisms of orphanage was that it, it was exploiting children for their labor. It was exploitive. They were, it was sweatshop. Oh, yeah. Now, now do you think that's a valid criticism? <laughs> Uh, they probably did over workers, I mean, work us. Uh, I mean, we worked 50 hours a week during the uh, summers, including Saturday mornings, and then I worked for pay on Saturday afternoons, and during the school year we worked about 20 hours a week, and they probably OD'd on that, and they probably OD'd on religion and, and, and other things. But uh, I'm, I'm talking about ODing at the margin. Uh, from my perspective, uh, I now can recall memories of work that were uh, were terrific and valuable. If nothing else, they they taught me to show up at, to work on time and uh, made me really uh, uh, sweat. And I was in pretty good shape by the time I I, I graduated. And and we boys were, had. Uh, a football team that was better than you would expect from only having 27 available bodies, uh, primarily because we worked uh, so much in, in the fields, and we've just meaner in hell on the on the football field. But from my perspective, the work experience uh, was a terrific, life-enhancing. Uh, I can tell my colleagues uh, at the University of California, Irvine, that I've had work experiences they will never. Uh, come close to having, and and I feel I feel advantaged just because I can understand uh, uh, life situations that they have no uh, re relation to. I want you to comment for me, and I appreciate what you're doing. You okay? I'm fine. I just I hope I don't talk too much. No, no, no. I want you to comment on your assessment of the uh, efficacy of uh, temporary assistance to needy families. Uh, used to be known as aid to families with dependent children, which obviously really in many ways eliminated 
or sharply reduced a traditional market yes. for orphanages. What what do you think of those systems? How, how how are they working? What do you think of their efficacy? Well, I, I that's not a uh, uh, an area that I have covered in in great detail, although I've paid attention to it over the years. Uh, clearly, uh, the rise of foster care and the rise of aid to mothers with dependent children is one of the reasons uh, orphanages uh, uh, folded or contracted. Uh, there just wasn't the pool of, of kids when in fact you pay mothers to keep their children and or you take the children and put, in, put, put them in foster homes. You just don't have the pool of, of children to, uh, for the orphanage to draw on. And that's one of the reasons that during the 1950s, uh, my home had 225 to 250 students uh, in 1952 and it had 125 when I, uh, uh, when I left. And I think all of, uh, there was, you know, the, these issues, foster care and aid, uh, were reasons uh, that, that it began to contract. Contract in terms of kids who were disadvantaged. And, and one of the reasons the kids in orphanages in my era uh, have done well is first these orphanages were not bad places that they've been made out to be but the other thing is that uh, orphanages were selective on the intake and had to be selective on the intake. Uh, they couldn't take bipolar kids uh, and mix them with just disadvantaged kids. They took in kids whom they felt could work well with other children in a, a congregate care uh, community uh, setting. So, and then the orphanage, um, it sort of eliminated uh, uh, the bad family environmental situations such as what I was in. When I went to my orphanage, I no longer had to deal with alcoholic uh, parents. <laughs> the house parents were not alcoholic. Uh, and I, uh, I had the advantage of, of resetting my life, uh, of course. So, uh, yeah, those, those issues caused orphanages to fold and it, and it made them look for other markets. Well, wait, which, isn't it better? Because as you well know, many of the children who came to orphanages came because their, their, their families couldn't afford to, to, to maintain them. They that's came right. for economic reasons. Yes, it was. Uh, Don't you think that the uh, emergence of AFDC and TANF has been a good thing? Uh, no doubt uh, that we've saved a lot of families and more so than those systems have been given uh, credit for. Uh, but we've also uh, enabled uh, dysfunctional families uh, to keep kids in care, in their biological family care, uh, for longer periods of time. So uh, oftentimes uh, kids become more dysfunctional uh, because of these uh, care systems or the aid uh, type systems. And you keep them in uh, bad environments, gang infested uh, environments, uh, uh, because the mother can afford uh, to keep them there. And so um, uh, there, you know, there, there are pluses and minuses to the system. I have no idea as to what the total net effect of it is. What I do know, or do believe, or have come to believe from a lot of research that I've, I've done on this, is that uh, there's a place in the menu of child care options for orphanage type settings. Call them what you want. Academies, uh, schools, uh, you name it. Uh, there are all kinds of children's homes. I mean, everyone thinks that orphanage is the O word, and and uh, I, I grant grant them that it has uh, had bad connotations. But some of my work has been to try to disabuse people of those connotations and make uh, orphanage a, a good word again. Just like uh, orphanage became a bad word because it was under assault not only by the social welfare workers but also by films like Oliver uh, and Annie. Uh, asylum uh, at one time was considered uh, a good word. In fact orphanages were called asylums. Uh, and uh, asylum really means a peaceful place apart. And, but it got a bad uh, reputation. Orphanages in the first millennium uh, were called conservatories. 
And we now have conservatories that focus on music because all the orphanages uh, in that early era supported themselves by having boys and girls choirs that went around singing uh, for support funds. Are you saying that uh, orphanages are not the best solution for child welfare for all children, but they are the best for some children? Right. Uh, foster care works wonders. I'm sure there are a lot of foster parents out there doing God's work uh, with the kids they care for. Uh, but many kids don't fit uh, that model. Uh, some kids uh, become hostile when they're taken in uh, by strange parents and have to work with uh, uh, biological uh, kids uh, and, and, and be second fiddle. One, one of the things I've heard is, even people who would agree with you, that we now know that it is essential for the healthy development of a child to have an extreme amount of one-on-one -on -one close supervision and that what Newt Gingrich was talking about would cost enormous amounts of money because it, it would be so expensive. Understanding what we now know about child development, it would be horrifically expensive to maintain an orphanage that would, would, would fit those particular yeah. needs. Well, Do you agree well, with that? Well, I'll, I'll get to the, uh, to the ex expense of it in, in a little bit. But uh, it, when you're talking about kids who are just disadvantaged, the one-on-one -on -one care is not always uh, necessary uh, for kids. Although it would always be better to have one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, it'd be better to have five-on-one. -on -one. But that also drives up, up the cost. and You have to have some economic realities uh, uh, introduced. Uh, in my era, I was glad that I was, in, I was sent to a cottage at the start at 10 years old uh, where there were 24 kids in the cottage with one house parent. I was pleased at that because I wasn't interested in, an, in a family mother son type relationship with the house parent. Besides, if one house parent has to supervise uh, 24, 10, and uh, 11 year old boys, you can get away uh, with a lot of stuff. There's a lot of freedom uh, to do all sorts of things. Uh, with 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 numbers, and then you you also get a lot of support from uh, from the additional children. Now, fast forward, where you know children's homes no longer take in just disadvantaged kids, but children who have multiple uh, uh, traumas uh, in their background. Uh, then the need for uh, care that's closer to one on one uh, it, it gets all the greater. And of course, when you go from taking in disadvantaged kids to taking in kids with multiple traumas, the cost of care uh, goes up uh, rather substantially, especially if the kids can't do anything. That is, can't work and help uh, with covering uh, the cost. One of the reasons I did, a, a sh I, I produced a video short on, on the Cross North School in the mountains of North Carolina is that it strikes me, it's always struck me as as a children's home with its head screwed on right, especially with the head, uh, the late Phyllis uh, Crane, who was a wonderful, marvelous, charismatic uh, leader of that home that uh, uh, believed in just common sense uh, child uh, welfare. And, and she also limits the degree of difficulties of the kids that come there. But the kids do come with multiple uh, uh, traumas. I interviewed when I was writing a book on, on the Cross North School and doing the, uh, the video short, uh, I interviewed children, uh, some of whom uh, lived in uh, rat infest, they were at Cross North because their home was, uh, was closed, condemned, because it was rat infested. And I asked the child, I said, are we talking about small mice or are we talking about, you know, sizable rats? And she said, it's the latter. And I said, well, were those, did you catch a rat every now and then in, in a trap or did they scatter like roaches with the light, when the lights come on? She said, it was the latter. That is, you turn on the light and the rats would go. And she said, she said in our home, uh, the rats could eat the cats. Uh, 
then they were they were they had to deal with uh, uh, mothers who were pill heads, and I never understood that term until I, I went there. That is, they were addicted to all kinds of, of pain uh, relief uh, drugs and anxiety uh, relief uh, things, and. Um, then there was sex, sexual molestation at, at the Cross North School today. Forty-five percent of the kids who come there have sexual molestation in their in their backgrounds. Not that they're not sexual predators, but they have had uh, they've been molested by mainly family members. Let me interject one thing. I went to Ch the Thompson Child and Family Focus, which is that kind of contracted orphanage that you were talking about before. They take severely sexually, emotionally, physically abused children. Yeah. The, the head of that organization said what really runs the show is Medicaid. In other words, she said they only have a certain limit that they can have those children in that institution because Medicaid wants them out of there, yeah. wants them in foster care, because foster care is a lot less expensive. And so they are, they, now, do you have any thoughts about the impact of federal Medicaid funding on these contracted orders? Well, I, I, I do feel like many children's homes today, or whatever they're called, uh, have lost sight that costs matter. And that we do have children's homes out there that admit that their cost per full-time equivalent child is hundred thousand dollars plus uh, a year uh, and but they take in some really difficult kids now cross door on the other hand takes in kids who've had these traumas but they haven't become dysfunctional uh, because of these traumas they've interrupted the uh, the problem before the kid is is needs uh, extensive therapeutic care now they do get counseling and some therapy and and so forth to deal with uh, uh, with problems as you might imagine I mean if if, if a child is is uh, has to be informed uh, that his mother has been put away in prison uh, for life or her uh, parental rights have been permanently terminated because of past abuse. Uh, you can imagine that, that child is going to need some uh, comforting from uh, from counseling, and and Crossnor has that. Uh, what is remarkable about Crossnor and a couple other places around the country is that they seem to have their costs uh, under control, but at the same time they're delivering uh, the services, and I don't know how they do it for the cost. I their marginal cost, their marginal operating cost at Crossnor has to be in the area of $25,000 a year per full-time equivalent child. And I say $25,000 because they seek funding, they seek scholarships uh, at that level. Send $25,000 and we can take care of an additional uh, child. So uh, uh, I, I think the cost can get out of hand. But again, you can, you know, the higher up you go in, in, in this uh, child care game, the, the cost is going to be higher. Now, the two, in my views, the two evils that, are, that have taken over child welfare philosophy uh, come in two pat phrases, family preservation and family reunification. The child welfare system is so tied to family preservation uh, that they tr keep the kids with the families as long as they possibly can and they try to help them but then the kids are in these dysfunctional situations which means that uh, the longer you preserve the family the more dysfunctional many kids become. Now I have to add that family preservation no doubt helps many families. They become functional again. But at the same time, they're, they're failures in that system, uh, which means that the child has had to uh, endure greater fun uh, dysfunctionality and, and probably it moves off into uh, becoming a, a, a drug dealer uh, of, of the parent or starts duplicating uh, the be bad behaviors uh, of the parent. Now, the family reunification, that's the philosophy that says if you put a child in a place like Crosnor or Thompson today. The best course is to get that child back to the family uh, as soon as possible. One, the one-on-one -on -one philosophy, and two, the cost savings uh, that go with it. Well, 
uh, with the cost savings, there's a strong incentive for, uh, uh, for social workers to move children back to the family uh, when, in fact, uh, the family has only pretended uh, to rehabilitate it itself. So the child is put back into uh, the uh, family, the dysfunctional family, and has to endure uh, the problems that reemerge there. The child is pulled away from that family and then will be put in foster care placement, then another foster care placement, then another one, then another one, and then maybe they'll end up at a place like uh, the Cross North School. And I could, I could also talk about the Connie Maxwell Children's Home in, uh, in South Carolina, which is a wonderful place. And so you have this tug of war. Cross North gets, gets children, has them for several months. Their average stay is 15 months. They get pulled away, put back in, and everything, every, all the gains that they've made with the child are destroyed. The child comes back into care and they have to uh, start, a, start again. And, that just, and that's one of the reasons costs are as high as they are. Uh, and could be lower if, in fact, we just recognize that some kids just need a permanent uh, a place that they can call home. And, and one of the problems in child welfare is the is how uh, this one-on-one -on -one care is elevated, but uh, the the importance of permanence and security and sense of place, sense of home. Uh, have been uh, de-emphasized. Richard, you're an extraordinarily uh, successful person, professional. To what extent what you are today, sitting here, is due to the fact that you were in Barium Springs? I, I think I'm talking to you today after having had a career in, in u university professorships. I'm talking to you today uh, not in spite of my orphanage background but because of my orphanage background. I was catapulted from a life path before I was 10 that was to no good to a life path that had hope uh, and, and real uh, potential. Uh, I was the kid playing hooky uh, in kindergarten. Now who else plays hooky in kindergarten? I stole the lunch money of the little girl that sat next to me in kindergarten. I was shoplifting at six and seven. I was burglarizing people's garages. What for? Well, I, I had a little business going getting coat hangers and selling them to cleaners. And uh, I, I, that's why I earned my my spending money. And then, of course, I I I, I hate to admit it, but I did shoplift yo-yos. What purpose? Uh, to sell them to other kids. And then, of course, we were breaking into the movie theaters on Saturday afternoon and, and so forth. When I got to bury him, oh, I was also the uh, the fighter on the on the school grounds. If there was a fight, I was in it. Uh, I was doing poorly. Uh, I had the run of streets of Raleigh, North Carolina, and but when I got to bury him, uh, there were serious boundaries uh, uh, imposed on me. One was by the other kids who were much stronger than I was, so I wasn't about to get in as many uh, fights. And then you had, uh, I didn't have to worry about the bad things in my past family life. I, there was somebody there looking at what I was doing, monitoring what I was doing. My mother couldn't do it. She was drunk all day. Um, and then I had an opportunity for an education I wasn't getting uh, in Raleigh before I went to uh, Berrien Springs. And once I got through high school, uh, I was, we from the orphanage were in the top tier of Troutman High School in one regard. Well, a couple of regards, but one regard, and that is we were one of the few from that county high school that knew that we could go to college if we could get in. Uh, most of the other uh, families that went to, to Troutman uh, had limited resources. We knew uh, we could go to college, and so I could bank on it. Talk to me about your special teacher. Uh, she made all the difference. My seventh grade teacher, Frances Moore, uh, was an angel. 
uh, two regards. One is she put up with my uh, fighting my uh, shadows of my past and I was playing tricks on her and and I just was a little devil in class if she would say two plus two is four I'd ask why now today I see that as a profound uh, uh, philosophical question but that wasn't my intent uh, then my intent was just to throw her off and but she uh, uh, she kept at it and she kept uh, <laughs> holding me responsible with with punishments and I finally uh, saw the light and just changed courses in the seventh grade. I went from somebody who was maybe behind in math to uh, doing ninth grade math uh, under Mrs. Moore um, uh, in the uh, seventh grade. And when I graduated from high school, I recognized her as being my favorite teacher and the person who really uh, made a difference uh, in my ability to get through high school. When I uh, I graduated from college. Uh, I I invited her. She came. Uh, when I started writing books, I dedicated a book to her. Uh, and I just can't tell you how important she has been uh, in my life because because of her. A happened, then B followed, C followed that, and and so I'm where I am today. I haven't done everything I wanted to do. I haven't been the, uh, I'd love to have done much more, more successful, but uh, I attribute a lot of what I was able to do to, um, to Francis Moore and other key uh, people on campus, and as you may have read in the, in the home, there was a black uh, worker, Joe, who was, um, was critically uh, important. I used to go out to fields with him, and, and he'd talk uh, wisdom uh, to me, uh, not the least of which was uh, Dicky, and that's what they called me when I was a kid, Dicky. Uh, uh, everybody's got attitude, and he'd say it in his southern slang. Everybody attitude. Everybody's got attitude. Having the right attitude. That's what's uh, uh, that's what's in, uh, important. And then he would tell me things like, um, uh, you know. It's easy to turn sugar into shit. It's hard to turn shit into sugar. And I recommend that you work uh, on the latter. Do you have anything you'd like to ask? Tell me a little more about Mrs. Moore. Was she part of the staff of Barium Springs uh, Home? Or how, was she public school or what? Uh, we had, our, up until I was in ninth grade, Barium Springs had historically had a school on, on campus from first grade to high school, had our own football teams and so forth. But then Berrien was big enough to field football teams and whatever. Uh, they had a school and the school was had more credentialed teachers than the county schools had. Our school was better than the uh, uh, the local school. And so she was a part of the, uh, the Berrien school. Now I don't know whether she was paid by the state or by Berrien or whatever. I presume uh, she was paid by the state. And, and by the way, um, uh, Mrs. Moore and I have uh, stayed in contact uh, at one Christmas some years ago when I had done something that was reported in her paper, in her news, local newspaper, she stitched uh, the, some poem she had uh, rewritten on what it means to be successful. And it ends with the thoughts of, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's really the heart and soul is, is is really what counts uh, in this life. You and, anything else you know? Oh, one other one other thing. We were just in uh, contact uh, a month ago uh, when her daughter uh, let me know that her, her, Mrs. Moore's uh, uh, husband had died, and and so I wrote Mrs. Moore and I recounted again. Uh, and she's 80 some years old now, 86, 88, um, and I, I just recounted uh, what she had had met to me and she wrote me back a wonderful uh, letter uh, about how proud she was of me and uh, all, all of that uh, which uh, was was meaningful in itself because she you know Adam Smith talks about our having an impartial spectator on our shoulder uh, who's, who's judging us and, and Smith wanted the moral worth of what you 
do. Well, Mrs. Moore has been sitting on my shoulder uh, uh, throughout my life and, and my career, and I've always had to deal with my imagined reaction of, of her to what I was doing or, or wasn't doing. Do you think you've learned something from her that you've been able to inculcate in some of your students who see you as a mentor? Well, I, I hope I have. Uh, I know I, uh, I, I'm at a research university that uh, finds research extraordinarily Im important, uh, but uh, I've had, a, had the good fortune for the past 20 years of teaching MBA students, and I've certainly tried to, um, uh, to try to be the teacher uh, that, that, that she was, and the teacher of a couple graduate professors uh, who I had uh, in, in class. And uh, I, I hope I've been successful. I don't know, I forget this, but I've gotten teaching awards one after the other, and uh, uh, you know, that's been extraordinarily satisfactory to me. And I mean, you know, I'm not going to use this, but I've converted my lectures to um, a video lecture course, 58 lectures, 30 minutes long. And as of a week ago, we had uh, 10,000 students enroll in the class, and, and it's probably going to have 60,000 by the time it opens January 1. How's that? That's, that's good. <laughs> Do you have anything else? Do you have anything else you'd like to say? No. Well, you have been Oh, so the, o the only, the only, uh, maybe I... Uh, I just turned it off. I turned it back on. Okay, turn it back on. I'll, I'll